Japan just added 110 Chinese companies to its export control blacklist in a single move, targeting semiconductors, AI chips, quantum computing, and even chip cooling equipment. Some Western media outlets called it the toughest export control action against China yet, surpassing even U.S. restrictions. But what no one expected was how quickly China's countermeasure left Japan scrambling for options. The question isn't just why Japan decided to sanction China. It's who's really pulling the strings and what happens when a country that depends on Chinese rare earths decides to pick a fight it can't win. Semiconductors are the oil of the information age. Whoever controls semiconductor materials and manufacturing capabilities holds the key to technological dominance and national security. That's why, starting in 2022, the United States began restricting China's semiconductor development across the entire supply chain, from upstream materials to high-end production equipment. Nearly every link has faced suppression. So far, more than 15,000 Chinese companies have been added to the U.S. restricted entity list. And the United States has never lacked loyal followers. The Netherlands, one of America's core allies in Europe, recently cited national security to forcibly take over Nexperia, a Chinese-owned semiconductor company, freezing global assets worth 14.7 billion yuan and initiating the dismissal of its Chinese management team. Japan, too, has ramped up pressure on China's semiconductor industry. In January 2025, Japan announced stricter export controls on technologies related to chips and quantum computing while expanding restrictions on advanced equipment and software. Although the Japanese government publicly claimed that the adjustment applied to all non-allied countries and was not specifically targeted at China, it was obvious to everyone that Japan was coordinating with the U.S. in suppressing China's semiconductor sector. After all, during the same month, the United States also updated its export control rules, introducing new restrictions on the export of advanced computing semiconductors. The new regulation classifies countries based on their ally relationships, defining different levels of access to U.S. chips worldwide. China has been placed in the most restricted category. By September 2025, Japan updated its export control list again, this time directly adding 110 Chinese companies to the restricted entities list. These companies and institutions are concentrated in critical technology fields, such as semiconductors, artificial intelligence, lithography machines, and quantum computing. Compared with the U.S. approach, Japan's measures are even harsher. While the U.S. mainly restricts certain high-end chips, Japan is targeting the entire industry chain. Even auxiliary equipment and chip cooling devices are included in the restrictions. Under this policy, China and other non-allied countries face far stricter approval procedures when applying for related exports. Even allied countries must submit documentation to Japan for review so that Japan can assess whether the exported equipment could be re-exported through third parties to China or other blacklisted nations. It's worth noting that before Japan added those 110 Chinese companies to its export control list, the United States had also announced in the very same month the inclusion of 23 Chinese companies in its own restricted entity list, 13 of which were related to semiconductors and integrated circuits, covering key links from chip design and manufacturing to supply chain support. Japan's near simultaneous decision to blacklist 110 Chinese companies was clearly meant to coordinate with the U.S. crackdown on China's semiconductor technology sector. Moreover, Japan has repeatedly stated that in its semiconductor export control policies, it will optimize its measures to remain aligned with the United States. So why is Japan so eager to suppress China's semiconductor industry? The answer lies in history and in fear. During the 1980s and 1990s, Japan was the dominant power in the global semiconductor industry. Companies like Toshiba, Hitachi, and NEC together held more than 50% of the global market share. But that advantage didn't last. 
After entering the 2000s, Japan's semiconductor industry was gradually overtaken by South Korea's Samsung and Taiwan's TSMC. At present, no Japanese foundry has the capability for mass production of 7 nanometer chips, while China's SMIC has already achieved successful trial production of 7 nanometer chip samples. That means Japan has actually fallen behind China in this field. In 2022, the Japanese government announced its support for the domestic company Rapidus, pledging an investment of $21.6 billion to develop 2 nanometer process technology. But the core technologies it relies on actually come from the American company IBM. Moreover, its pilot production isn't expected to begin until 2028, at least five years later than TSMC and Samsung. This means that Japan, once a semiconductor powerhouse, is now almost entirely absent from the development of high-end chips. As Japan's semiconductor industry declined, its market share inevitably began to erode. Take 6-inch silicon carbide wafers, for example. These used to be one of Japan's strong products. Before 2020, a single 6-inch SIC wafer cost as much as $1,300. Chinese companies not only had to pay high prices, but also wait up to six months in advance to secure an order. And even then, there was no guarantee of availability. But today, multiple Chinese companies have achieved mass production of 6-inch SIC wafers, bringing prices down to $800 per wafer, nearly 40% cheaper. This sharp price drop quickly shook the global market. Japan's Rome company had to slash its prices to around $900 and urgently invest in the development of 8-inch wafers to maintain competitiveness and profit margins. Another example is Japan's JFE Semiconductor, which produced low-voltage MOSFET chips under 100 volts, key components used in home appliances such as air conditioners and refrigerators. Previously, these chips cost as much as 40,000 yen per thousand pieces, severely squeezing the profit margins of Chinese appliance manufacturers that depended on them. However, after Chinese companies successfully began mass production of chips with the same specifications, the price dropped directly to 18,000 yen per thousand, a 55% reduction. Driven by cost advantages, more and more Chinese appliance makers switched to domestic alternatives. This led to a massive loss of orders and ongoing financial losses for JFE Semiconductor, which ultimately declared bankruptcy in 2023. Japan knows very well that if it doesn't act to curb China's semiconductor industry now, it won't be long before China's low-cost chips completely dominate the market. However, it's important to note that despite multiple rounds of suppression from the United States, China has consistently introduced effective countermeasures. And when it comes to Japan's deliberate provocation, China will certainly not remain silent. Japan is a country extremely lacking in natural resources. Due to its small land area and limited mining capacity, Japan's rare earth supply is almost entirely dependent on imports. Reports indicate that in the past, about 90% of Japan's rare earth supply came from China. According to available data, Japan's total rare earth imports in 2024 still exceeded 8,300 tons, of which more than 5,000 tons came from China, meaning Japan's dependence on Chinese rare earths remains above 60%. Since the beginning of 2025, China has implemented stricter controls on rare earth exports. This has prompted Japan to actively search for alternatives. It first signed a cooperation agreement with the United States, seeking to strengthen its rare earth supply chain through economic incentives and joint investments. Japan has also expanded cooperation with countries such as Australia and India to collectively respond to China's export restrictions. Yet, even with the combined efforts of these four countries, their total processing capacity is still less than 1% of China's. To secure more rare earth supplies, Japan has also been promoting the development of rare earth recycling technologies. Through policy support and financial subsidies, the government encourages companies to build recycling facilities to extract rare earth elements from discarded electronics, automobile components, and other sources.
But if China further tightens its approval process for rare earth exports to Japan or significantly delays the approval period, what consequences would Japan face without Chinese rare earth support? Currently, nearly all of Japan's high-end industries depend heavily on rare earth materials. If China were to impose a full-scale restriction on rare earth exports to Japan, the industry that would suffer the greatest blow would undoubtedly be the automotive sector. Producing a single new energy vehicle typically requires 2 to 3 kilograms of neodymium iron boron magnets, and the performance of these magnets depends critically on the addition of the element dysprosium. Once the supply of dysprosium is interrupted, the production lines of automakers such as Toyota and Honda would be forced to shut down. Their roughly 15% share of the global new energy vehicle market could be quickly eroded by competitors within just six months. If China maintains its export restrictions for an extended period, Japan's automotive industry could face annual output losses exceeding $20 billion. Without China's rare earth supply, Japan's semiconductor and electronics industries would also be severely affected. Rare earth elements are irreplaceable materials in key components, such as photoresists and sputtering targets. Take Japan's semiconductor giant Renesis Electronics as an example. Its power chip production lines require nearly 100 tons of rare earth compounds every month to maintain normal operations. Once the rare earth supply is disrupted, chip prices would inevitably rise, and the development of Japan's 3 nanometer process would slow down, causing it to lose momentum in its competition with Chinese and Korean companies. Even more critical is the role of rare earths in defense and strategic industries, whether it's the precision gyroscopes used in missile guidance systems or the microwave components needed for radar equipment all heavily depend on rare earth permanent magnets. The mass production plan for Japan's Self-Defense Forces Type 12 anti-ship missile, for instance, has been delayed due to uncertainty in rare earth supply. This kind of choke point issue directly touches the bottom line of Japan's national security, yet the country has no feasible way to secure sufficient rare earths from alternative sources in the short term. According to a report by Japan's Ministry of Finance, over the next five years, the overall cost of Japan's high-tech industries is expected to rise by 15 to 22 percent, which could even cause some defense-related orders to shift overseas. Japan holds no real advantage in its confrontation with China. While the United States is also restricting China's development, U.S. policies are often designed to gain leverage in negotiations and ultimately serve its own interests. For example, during the U.S.-China tariff war, tensions escalated at one point, but both sides eventually returned to the negotiating table because they both understood that maintaining high tariffs for too long would result in a lose-lose outcome for their economies and their citizens. By contrast, Japan's choices appear far more short-sighted and reactive. Japan is acting as a proxy, implementing restrictions that align with U.S. strategic goals, but that don't necessarily serve Japan's own economic interests. The country is sacrificing its access to critical materials and its competitiveness in global markets to maintain its alliance with Washington. And in the process, it's exposing itself to countermeasures that it has no capacity to withstand. China's rare earth leverage over Japan is overwhelming. Japan cannot replace Chinese rare earths in the short term. Recycling programs won't scale fast enough. Alternative suppliers don't have the capacity or the purity levels required for high-end manufacturing. And even if Japan could diversify its supply sources, the costs would be far higher eroding the competitiveness of Japanese industries across the board. The semiconductor restrictions Japan has imposed on China may slow China's progress in certain segments, but they won't stop it. China has already demonstrated its ability to develop domestic alternatives, scale production, and undercut global prices. Japanese companies that once dominated markets are now losing ground to Chinese competitors who can produce comparable products at a fraction of the cost. 
The more Japan restricts China's access to foreign technology, the more motivated China becomes to develop its own. And the more successful China becomes at building domestic supply chains, the less leverage Japan has. In the long run, Japan's decision to align itself so closely with U.S. tech restrictions could provoke stronger countermeasures from China, further weakening Japan's already fragile international standing and industrial competitiveness. Rare earth restrictions are just the beginning. China has other tools at its disposal regulatory barriers, market access restrictions, industrial policy measures that favor domestic companies over foreign competitors. And as China's technological capabilities continue to advance, the balance of power will shift further in its favor. Japan may have added 110 Chinese companies to its blacklist, but China controls the rare earths that power Japan's industries. That's not a symmetrical fight. It's a strategic mismatch, and as the consequences of Japan's actions become clearer, production shutdowns, rising costs, delayed defense projects, eroding market share, the question won't be whether Japan made the right choice. It will be how long Japan can sustain a policy that serves someone else's interests at the expense of its own.